So we each have microphones uh, readily available. None of this is for projection in this room. Uh, it's solely for the purpose of uh, the television version of this, which is being taped tonight for later rebroadcast. Re so to those um, who might see this from home, uh, welcome to an important meeting of the Harbor Development Committee. I'm Bill Reardon, the chair. Um, other members include Vice Chair Deirdre Anderson and other members Tom Co Coveney, Ed Morris, Brian Knees, and Bruce. Help me with your last name. Macaloni. Macaloni, thank you. Uh, also with us this evening are two members, uh, the chief, chief engineer for the town, Roger Fernandez, and his assistant, Tom Molinari, and two consultants that we've been working uh, very extensively with on the topic of the Harbor Wars, which is our major subject tonight. Uh, so Eric Gloss and Dan Gagney are also here with us this evening, and each, each will have an opportunity to participate in the meeting. So I'll call the meeting to order. Um, I want first to uh, be very appreciative to uh, the school committee and Dot Gallo and her staff. There was no room in the inn tonight. There is no other space available in town hall. Every meeting room is taken. Sanborn Auditorium is taken, the Senior Center is taken, the library is taken, and I didn't even know this room existed, and it's a great, it's a terrific room, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, secondly, I want to thank Harbor Media uh, and their manager for Hingham, Mike Parsons, and our uh, film person, uh, Michael Hong, who's behind that wall, uh, listening to us and, uh, and monitoring and picking up our, our uh, deliberations here. So let's kick the meeting off. Our, our major topic, as I uh, wrote in, in the commentary that I included in the Hingham Journal last Thursday, and also put on the town website, mentioning this meeting, that it's the culmination of a lot of effort that we've been going through over the last two or three years, um, and that um, I hoped others would come or be aware that it's going to be able to be televised at a later time. So we just have one uh, minor item of business before we get going on our major topic, and that is uh, there were some minutes. Uh, Brian drafted them. I reviewed them. Uh, Brian, I wanted to just quickly show you what I altered. Uh, they were minor edits, but just so you know how, how it modifies. Thanks. So um, all of us were at this meeting. Did anyone have any? Um, comments or corrections? If not, the chair would entertain a motion um, to approve the minutes of March 7th. I make a motion to uh, approve the minutes of March 2nd. 7th. 7th. Is there a second? Second. I think, you're, I think the mics will generally pick us up. He said about six inches works. You don't have to be right, right into it. So. Um, second. <laughs> Seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, I'm going to step up to the podium, which is also mic'd. Uh, I think I think it will be better for purposes of the presentation, and that's where our other speakers will uh, will speak as well. Who's got the clicker with the forward? Is it up there? The podium. Great. And Dan, if you would uh, do the deal on the lights. Thank you. So, um, ah, here's here's one problem. That'll be exciting. Can't see. <laughs> can't, can't see what I've what I've written. So, why are we here? Uh, you might ask, uh, and those at home might ask. Um, the answer can be seen right there, and again, right there. That's March third this year. Uh, so-called, I'd forgotten that it was called Winter Storm Riley, but uh, any who were close to the harbor um, at the height of the storm knew that we had uh, severe uh, tidal flooding um, and, and three of our town wharves were, were overrun, were overtopped. So that topic has been something that uh, the town has been worried about for some time. But I, I just wanted to, this, this shows uh, 
town pier and the harbor master shack which is hanging on for its dear life with basically the electric cord that go, went into, into it uh, and the other is is obviously Hingham Maritime and the Curtis Pavilion uh, with many of their boats uh, at, at, at almost at risk. Um, so let's come back. We're here tonight to talk about uh, the process that the Harbor Development Committee has been going through to get to a position where we could recommend to the town uh, a, a, an approach to rebuilding the harbor wharves and also having them address uh, sea level rise or sea level resiliency is the term that's being used. We've been at this for about uh, four years, started in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2014, 15. Uh, that's when the so-called Kleinfelder study was done for the town, community preservation committee funds, 60 some odd thousand dollars, uh, a, a scientific approach to looking at risk management for the town of Hingham, um, and uh, advice to the town and to the to the engineers and to the uh, selectmen about infrastructure that that might be at risk. Uh, subsequently, uh, we've we've gone on to engage uh, an outside firm, Beals and Thomas. We, the Harbor Development Committee, with funding from the town, um, t looking to repair uh, and and improve um, the the harbor wharves to try to address those flooding situations. Um, our our issue has been um, how do we prioritize how we go about what will be an expensive process? How do we address uh, our tolerance for risk? Um, and, and then in the end, balance out the three topics of safety, cost, and aesthetics. Uh, that's a mantra that I've been using since our discussions in the fall with various uh, parties. Uh, but that's really what, what our discussions have been all about. So a bit of the chronology. In, in March of 2015, we, we really first developed an action plan to say, okay, what is it that we need to do in order to be able to assess the current situation of the structure of our three town-owned harbor wharves? And let's just, um, sorry, I've got to get back. I want to just orient everyone here uh, these are the wharves uh, and, and the harbor front, uh, the inner harbor that we're, that we're going to be talking about this evening. And I'll just point out with the pointer the three wharves that we're talking about, because not everyone knows where these wharves are. The first is, is Town Pier right here. Some call this Iron Horse Park. I was chided last week t uh, because by the town uh, historian who said, well, it's not iron, it's bronze. Please call it the Bronze Horse Park. But for some reason, it's Iron Horse Park. Uh, the next parcel is next to, this is Whitney Wharf, which has already been rebuilt in, two th in 2003. And next to it is the Veterans Memorial and the former mobile station parcel right here. We are dealing with that as a single parcel. So we refer to it as the Veterans, um, Veterans Memorial and, and the mobile station. And finally, but importantly, is um, the... Uh, Barnes Wharf, the home of Hing Hingham Maritime. Some of the folks at home will remember that we've, the town has entered into a 30-year lease agreement with Hingham Maritime. Uh, under that agreement, it's, it's the town's responsibility to maintain the wharf, and it's Lincoln, Hingham Maritime's uh, responsibility to run the programs, and they are committed to a significant fundraising to build a new structure for their uh, sailing fleet and their and their rowing fleet. So we've been working with them as well. So those are the three parcels that we're going to be speaking of this evening. So back to the chronology. Um, in, in 2015, for the first time, we got some serious money to begin to look at uh, the, the harbor wharves. And the first thing that we asked our consultants, Beals and Thomas, to do was to go out and literally, uh, from, from end to end, uh, take take a look at sections of the harbor wharves, 25 feet at a, at a time, as I recall, uh, Eric, something, something like maybe 50 feet, uh, and, and just, just visual assessment. Where was the, 
where were the walls breaking down? Where were there, where was there bowing because of uh, freezing and and or the action of wind and tide over time, uh, and and bring all of that uh, back to us. Um, subsequently, that, that's when we kind of went through a little bit of of the of the risk assessment, and and tried to determine you know which of the wars that we really needed to pay attention to first. And it was those three that I just showed you, Town Pier, uh, Veterans Park, and the mobile station, and Barnes Wharf. I, I will acknowledge now that Steamboat Wharf, the last, the last parcel, uh, which is this one over here, we have not prioritized because at this time uh, it's not used as much. There's no current plan for it. And in terms of uh, flooding and seacoast uh, resiliency, because of Summer Street and the hill of Summer Street, uh, that wharf, whether it floods or not, does not significantly impact uh, flooding coming, coming from the harbor. So further to the physical assessment, we subsequently uh, got additional money from the town, this is in 2017, to begin to do um, seismic and, and um, topographic and, and bathymetric, I'm using terms that I'm not f as familiar with as our engineers, uh, effectively uh, looking at what's under the existing walls, what are the piers made up of, um, so that if we're going to build new walls or add to the height of the walls, we want to be certain that um, the, the current structures can support them, or if they can't, then the, the design of a new wharf has to uh, take take that situation into effect. Uh, that was another $240,000 that was appropriated by the town in 2017. During the rest of 2017 and into this year, our consultants have been completing that um, uh, size uh, uh, work on, on taking borings and doing test pits and, and getting a sense for what, what are we dealing with in terms of the wharves that we're looking at. And they, uh, have been meeting with us subsequently to begin to look at. Uh, okay, we know you know we know the information we need to know now. Uh, what is it that we want um, our wharves to begin to look like, and uh, what are we going to do in terms of sea level rise, in terms of flooding? So that was a that was a major discussion in in, in October. Um, we did two things. We first um, the Kleinfelder survey of tidal flooding had, had looked at two periods, 2030 and 2070, uh, with projections. We all know that sea level rise is, is somewhat of a hot topic in the country and in our state, uh, but that's the best that this town has from a scientific standpoint of what we might expect, um, and they, ch they chose two points. Uh, we chose, with our consultants, to focus on the 2030 projections and to do our risk assessments off of that. And then we, uh, in a series of meetings, looked at the question of, okay, um, if there is a 2% chance of major flooding in a 100-year storm in 2030, how, how much flooding are we willing to put up with as a town? Uh, it was not an easy conversation. And again, we're, we're weighing, knowing that to the extent that we raise these wharves, it's going to be a good deal more expensive um, the higher we go. Uh, and there's also the aesthetic issue of if we raise the walls so high, we begin to lose the vision, uh, the visibility of the harbor as you go by. So that led to an interesting analysis, and I want to share this one with you. This is a little difficult to read if you're f at home but I'll focus in on what was important to the Harbor Development Committee uh, about this slide. Roger Fernandez and Tom Molinari went around the entire harbor and looked at all of the structures that we have in the harbor to, to compare the heights for those structures to the heights for the three town-owned wharves that we're looking at. So some, some touch points. This um, column here represents the relatively new, two years old, Roger, three years old, armor stone wall that uh, was put at the edge of the uh, grove in the Bathing Beach uh, Trustees parcel. 
in other words, right in front of the old bathhouse, um, to, ad to address a, a, a deteriorating situation where the, the earth was just being undercut. And uh, that has replaced, that's at a height. And, it, and there are two different kinds of heights that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this is NAVD, uh, which is a sort of universal engineering height above which engineers uh, speak. We'll, we'll later have to speak about a tidal height, which is slightly different, and, but we'll, we'll make the connection for you. So that was one. That's the armor stone. Secondly, uh, townspeople will, will know that we uh, built a substantial structure at the edge of the parking lot at the bathing beach, interlocking concrete uh, blocks that protect the bathing beach from being further eroded in the kinds of major storms that we've had this winter. Uh, covered by a sacrificial dune uh, of sand. Um, happily, we're able to say that uh, this winter, that structure really did its job. Uh, some of the sacrificial dune was sacrificed, and we'll, we'll have to replace that. But the concrete blocks held. There was no undercutting of the parking lot, um, so that has, has worked. Now look at some of the other structures. So that's um, the bathing beach w wall is at 10 feet 8. In NAVD. Armorstone is at 12 and a half feet. Interestingly enough, Whitney Wharf, the one wharf which the town has significantly modified in, in recent times, uh, is at a little over 11 feet. Compare that with Town Pier, 7.2 feet. Veterans Park, 7.2 feet. The mobile station actually 6 feet, 6.9 feet and Barnes Wharf at 7.3 feet, all roughly four feet lower than um, Whitney Wharf. I happened to be down at the harbor for some of the earlier storms, not quite as severe as the one where the, f the flood over overran Town Pier. And I was amazed on a, on a day when the water was right at the top of the Town Pier seawall and I looked over at Whitney Wharf, and lo and behold, there was three to four feet. So it, it, just, it just confirmed all of these um, measurements that Roger Fernandez and Tom Molinari did. So the process that the committee went through was to think in terms of, well, what kind of risk would we be taking on? Uh, and what's our, our job in terms of dealing with now and dealing with the long-term future? Where we landed and then went to the advisory committee and to the selectmen was to say, look, for our generation, we're going to focus on a uniform height that will address uh, the majority of the high tides that we have been facing, at least uh, now and, and for, for the near future. And that is to say, to, to target the same height as Whitney Wharf. So our consultants said, look, we can't design anything for you until you give us a target height. And we chose the, the target height of roughly 11 feet. Uh, that's a judgment and a recommendation that the advisory committee is aware of and the selectmen uh, have, have agreed and have approved at a meeting in December, as I recall. So where does that take us now? Um, we have a height. We know the wharves that we want to work on. Now we need to think about how do we go about um, addressing uh, the structures and the heights of the walls and, and, and how do we deal with raising the walls four feet? Is it, uh, and there, there are various alternatives to that. For that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Eric Loss from Beals and Thomas and ask him to come up and walk us through the analysis that his firm has done of, of various alternatives uh, for our consideration and uh, for sharing with others in town. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Um, as Bill had noted, um, once we had the elevation established, what we did is um, made a minor adjustment just as we as we started doing the drawings um, for the conceptual design phase and the vertical datum that Bill had alluded to with that elevation, uh, 11 feet on the previous slide here, um, 
what we're going to be using for our drawings and the, and the conceptual drawings that I show you, we're using a mean low water datum. So it's another type of vertical datum. Um, it's a, there's a 5.2 foot uh, vertical adjustment between NAVD and our mean low water datum. Um, so the elevation 11 feet in NAVD in the subsequent drawings that we'll be using, we're going to be referring to that as elevation 16.2 in the mean low water. Um, and what mean low water datum is, is essentially the mean low water point, um, we set that at zero and everything is relative to the mean low water, um, positive and, ne and negative from there. So um, it's just a different way. Uh, it's, it's often used for coastal projects uh, for permitting is to, to set your datum at um, with zero being at the mean low water elevation and have everything based off of that. But it's very easy with the 5.2 foot conversion to go from this representative exhibit of the structure elevations. You could just add 5.2 feet onto any of these elevations that you see here and you'll be in the equivalent mean low water datum. So I just wanted to clarify that um, before we move forward because I'll be referring to uh, elevations now um, in the mean low water datum um, on these subsequent exhibits. So what we did is we started with Town Pier and um, we actually started working with uh, actually a series of hand sketches at different uh, ideas and concepts and then what we did is we refined it down to, to three different um, alternatives that I'm going to present this evening and I'll talk through what each of the differences are um, in those and um, provide a little orientation for you all here. We've got Otis Street 3A to the south. Uh, here's Whitney Wharf, the new timber pedestrian bridge, Red Eye Roasters. Um, this is the boat ramp here, uh, parking lot, um, town pier with parking along the side here, um, the mound in the middle with the bronze horse on it, and um, north um, is essentially up on this page. So <clears throat> one of the things that I'll point out too is, you know, as we look at Town Pier and what what it is we're referring to when we say Town Pier, um, there is an existing vertical wall that starts at this point right here. This is a nice sandy beach that comes right up next to the boat ramp, um, and then we start transitioning into a, a very low uh, but vertical um, wall at this point, and then it goes into the you know the granite uh, stone block wall that that we're all accustomed to really seeing um, along the out, outer edge uh, right here. And then we're basically stopping at this point where it transitions to the Three Otis Street, uh, Bear Cove Marina property, and uh, a different wall, a different wall type at that point there. Um, so when we're thinking about options to make the wall more resilient um, and add additional safety factor for sea level rise and future storm surge. You know, again, we, we ultimately want to make sure that we really get up to that elevation 16.2 um, before we start getting really to Oda Street and, and a lot of critical infrastructure that's beyond that. Um, so that elevation, we started to look at ways we can achieve that elevation increase. Um, some of the considerations is that, you know, the, the wall that's there now, um, has been in place for quite a long time. Um, we were able to do some test pits out in front of the wall at low tide. And um, even with those, we didn't really get a clear assessment of, of what the foundation really is under there. There could be timber piles under the, the block that's out there right now, or it may just be resting on uh, fill material that was placed um, in that wharf. Um, so there are some unknowns. And as we think about the additional loading of going vertical with additional wall height, and we're talking at this point here of, of potentially going up 3.8 feet um, from, if we want to go back to the, the NAVD exhibit 7.2, we're looking to get to elevation 11 in a, in a NAVD um, datum. So adding an extra three, almost four feet on, um, you know, there's some structural considerations and geotechnical considerations that go into that. So in this particular alternative, instead of getting to that full height right at the outer face of the wall, we looked at having a stepped back wall. So stepping back away from the edge 
leaving enough room to, to have you know, a pathway that could be ultimately designed and, and determined um, as this progresses, but bringing the, the top of the wall up to elevation 14 and then having a shorter wall set back that would bring it up to the elevation 16 to uh, as a total height. So, you know, in terms of if you if you were to have a, f a future storm event with some sea level rise and there was some overtopping of the wall, well, it wouldn't really do a whole lot because it would only be flooding out, you know, this pathway. You would have this additional setback wall uh, behind it to really keep the majority of that storm surge um, off of the overall wharf. Um, so this was a way, th some of the advantages of doing this are that you don't have all that additional um, weight and loading of putting that additional wall height right at the outer edge of the wall. Um, but there are other considerations that play into this as well. The parking that's along the side of the wharf on the east side right now would, um, would go away. Um, and you know, we, you'd ultimately would still have um, the majority, the good majority of the wharf protected up to that elevation 16.2. Um, so we'll be taking questions on these different alternatives at the end. I'm going to just keep this moving and, and just go through because I've got uh, quite a few of these to go through. Um, the next alternative um, is going up to the full elevation 16.2 out at the outer face, so there's no inner wall. Um, whatsoever in here um, and where that existing short wall comes off on the west side um, we're proposing to put a, a stone revetment in at that location um, there's some permitting implications there that make that um, an attractive choice you know there there are coastal agencies that that prefer to see um, non-vertical seawalls um, that that's their you know, preferred approach uh, to doing things. Um, so by having a short section of Armistone revetment here, we're able to get away from going vertical, but still bringing the top of that Armistone revetment up um, to a much more uh, resilient height and elevation, uh, more consistent, and that, would, that could tie in um, and be compatible with, with the, vert, the higher vertical wall here. So um, overall, um, you know, the majority of the, the wharf doesn't change too much. The parking still would uh, be removed under this, this scenario, um, but essentially it's, it's going to a full 16.2 height at the outer edge with an armorstone revetment on the west side. Alternative three, a town pier, is essentially the same uh, because we're really focusing this evening on, on the wall improvements. Um, this just has a different parking configuration, but we'll be getting into parking and aesthetics and um, amenities at, at, at a future date. Uh, we really want to just focus on the, the wall alternatives uh, for the most part this evening. <clears throat> so now I will jump to to Barnes Wharf, um, quick orientation. We've got the, the 3A rotary right here in the lower left, uh, north facing up. Um, we have two different alternatives that I'll present this evening for Barnes. Um, the first is to um, construct the seawall up to elevation 14 and then there would be a setback wall um, away from the edge at, at this location here to um, provide additional resiliency down at this end, but still allow this area in here to be reconfigured for, for parking. Um, and the parking in, in this port would be brought up to elevation 16.2, so the wall doesn't go up to elevation 16.2, but we're able to achieve uh, the overall resiliency for the infrastructure to the south by bringing the, the grades in this area up in elevation, which thereby provides um, 
better resiliency of the wharf and ultimately greater resiliency to Route 3A and, and beyond um, south of there. Um, the next alternative for Barnes is, looks very similar. We have the short setback wall down into here, but one of the more notable uh, differences is that <clears throat> the elevations throughout the wharf um, would all be brought up. So the grades across the whole wharf um, through the import of, of fill material would all be brought up to elevation 16.2. Um, so the entire wharf would be less prone to flooding um, while still providing the same protections to, to Route 3A and, and south uh, under this scenario here. Then we're going to jump to, as Bill had noted, um, two parcels that we're considering as one project, which is the Veterans Memorial Park here in the form of mobile station property. We have private property on the east side and Whitney Wharf um, and what we call um, this little piece here, Veterans, Veterans Park West. Um, this wall construction type is consistent with, with Whitney Wharf. So, so from here over to here is all in good condition as part of the rebuild that was done in 2003. So we're focused on the wall from this point uh, to this point right here. Um, there is an existing um, <clears throat> wall in place on the private property that we would not be impacting, but we do have to plan to tie into that um, structure on this east side, so that was an additional consideration um, as well. One of the, the key things in, in the third option that I'll show uh, that is it, the way that the, the revetment is depicted here um, is hard to see, but there is actually a portion of, of the Veterans Park where uh, there is not a vertical seawall in place already, and that's, that is important from a permitting perspective because when you're trying to go um, and put a new vertical wall in where there wasn't one historically, uh, that has become very challenging um, in recent years. So that is a, is a key consideration that has gone into uh, the conceptual design development. Um, whereas um, this, this particular alternative would, would take what is vertical, which is a piece here and, and majority of this down here, and get away from that vertical structure and go to a sloped structure. Um, I have a, a good a picture um, just after these three exhibits uh, depicting that armorstone revetment, which is uh, th that example is, is down south, uh, excuse me, north of the bathing beach. <clears throat> um, so this slopes back um, with armorstone and this brings the top of the revetment right here up to elevation 16.2. So you're getting um, that full resiliency height uh, right at the top of the revetment. And then there would be, uh, you know, um, a walking path or the, the park amenities, um, you know, to the south that would all uh, be determined as we, uh, as we proceed forward. Um, these, these lines here, you may be wondering, th those are typically representative of, a, of indicating a downward slope. Um, so, you know, this is a slope down towards the water. Um, from a permitting perspective, um, this does have, this approach does have some advantages. Um, now this alternative is slightly different, relatively the same idea, just the top of the wall would only come up to elevation 14 mean low water. And due to the natural grade change um, along the south side of these parcels, um, the topography here rises naturally. Um, so you could get up to the elevation 16.2 before you got to um, before you got to 3A. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to get up to 16.2 right at the top of the wall. Um, it just would mean that a portion of the park could flood during um, more severe storm events or with with additional sea level rise. Um, so same concept, just a different elevation. The footprint of this wall um, is is a bit narrower. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't occupy as much of the as much of these parcels. And then the third alternative and the final alternative 
that I'll be sharing this evening is is one that we we're showing here because we evaluated it, but we we think it would be almost impossible to permit. Um, would be going to um, rebuilding the vertical wall where there is existing vertical wall and putting a new vertical wall where there currently is not a vertical wall um, and and getting up to elevation 16.2 right at the um, at the seaward word face of this here um, so those were the different elevational uh, design kind of approaches that we've been been looking at the next thing that we the next layer of, of, of thought process really is well what type of construction so um, each of those scenarios there there are different ways to get to those elevations that I was referring to um, so tying into the former mobile station and veterans park site I was referring to the armor stone revetment um, this is a project that was done by the town um, Roger and um, his team um, got this project done successfully um, at a very low cost to replace what was essentially a pile of very small rock um, with a very degraded um, bank that was continuing to wash out with each and every coastal storm and, and replace that with a, um, a much more modern um, style armor stone revetment with large size stone um, set up to an appropriate elevation and, and backfilled uh, with chink stone um, and properly keyed into, um, into the dune in front of it. Um, so this is, this is the type of construction that I was referring to for um, at Town Pier, adjacent to the boat ramp on the west side, as well as uh, the options for uh, Veterans Park and the former mobile station site. Um, this is a project that um, is um, to some extent still go ongoing um, in down in, in Fall River. This is where the the Taunton River comes in. Um, north is to the right. You can see the Brayton Point um, power plant um, back here. This is Mount Hope Bay. Um, this is one of the city's uh, existing wharves. It's a granite block construction. You can see how it's bowing and bending, um, leaning here, um, definitely in a state of, of disrepair. Um, and what um, the city had chosen to do uh, was to put steel sheeting out on the seaward side um, all around this wharf and then essentially fill uh, the void space between the existing wall and that new sheeting uh, to provide a new stable structural face and then cap that um, ultimately in the end. So, you know, this is a... Um, a relatively, uh, you know, industrial kind of waterway and in, in, in area of the of the city. Um, so, but uh, certainly a, from a structural st standpoint, um, you know, a, a valid approach to um, improve the overall stability of the wharf without having to completely rebuild um, a new granite stone face. Um, these are two other types of construction that we'll, we'll be discussing in further detail. Again, you can you can get up to whatever elevation that your your target is in any of these. It's just a different um, different type of construction. There's a different there's different aesthetics. There's um, there's cons there's cost considerations that we'll be discussing next that go into these. Um, they're all you know they all generally achieve um, the same goal, which is to provide. Um, you know, protection, they have different life expectancies. Um, so the life cycle costs of these walls do tend to vary. Uh, this is a, a relatively new project that was done out at Oak, Oak Bluffs. Um, this is a, a steel sheet pile seawall. So, you know, the one that I just showed in, in Fall River was, um, you know, had a, a similar type of construction, but it certainly had a different aesthetic than, than this one. Um, you know, this is a, 
as far as steel sheet pile walls go. This is a pretty good looking one. Um, and then you have in Marshfield here, uh, kind of a more standard and stark uh, concrete seawall. Um, this is a project that we've referred to in, in previous um, meetings with the committee. Uh, this is uh, the Stacy Boulevard project in, in Gloucester. So this was an 1800 linear foot seawall rebuild. Uh, cost the city seven and a half million dollars, pretty much all in. Um, they had a, an existing um, granite block wall that was in, in disrepair, a lot of void spaces. And what they did was essentially they saved, um, they saved that, that stone. They built a, a new concrete wall behind it, put a new concrete footer beneath where that existing stone face was, and then they put that granite block back on that new footer on the on the seaward side, added new stone um, to kind of fill in the voids. But but the one key thing about the difference here is that this wall was rebuilt to the the same elevation that it was always at. So they, they did not come up in elevation to account for any sort of sea level rise or any additional resiliency. Um, so this is a, a good example because it was done you know, relatively recently, it, it, it took them a number of years to uh, to get the funding in place, again, to get, you know, nearly $8 million um, together to do this project. Um, but here's the, you know, kind of the end result. Um, so with those examples um, and the conceptual designs, um, the next item of discussion would be an analysis of initial costs that, um, that we looked at and some life cycle analysis um, based upon the different life expectancies. So turn that over to, uh, to Roger at this point. Good evening, Roger, and welcome. <coughs> Good evening, thank you. So <clears throat> this is sort of where the rubber hits the road to a certain extent. Um, one, first point out, uh, as you look at this chart or the screen and you see each column identified as alternate one, alternate two, alternate three, I want to make sure that's not confused uh, with the design alternates that Eric just presented, the intent there. Maybe they should have said example one, example two, and example three. The intent there is just to provide a sense of what the uh, mixes and matches of those different options might present in terms of cost. So, um, and I'll go through that in a second. I also want to let, uh, let everyone know, folks know, that what we did in an effort to derive these costs is, of course, work with our consultant, Beals and Thomas, but we also reached out to contractors um, and provided them the information that uh, we have to date. Um, and we received uh, some fairly detailed uh, responses um, that really broke down the costs um, in, in their entirety. Um, so that, that was very helpful. And the, and the third thing we did uh, is we actually reached out to the uh, design consultants working in Fall River over at City Pier. Uh, Tom and I went down to their uh, office. We sat down, presented the project, offered up what we had uh, gathered along with our consultants to this point in terms of cost and approach with the hope to, s to sort of get a uh, second party re re reaffirmation of the pricing and, and they, they also gave us some positive response in terms of what we came up here. So again, these are, these are preliminary costs um, and um, we think we did a fair amount of work to derive those costs. They do not include sidewalks, they do not include, does not include uh, landscaping does not include parking uh, creation or parking reconfiguration. Uh, as Eric had indicated, we know that that's still a work in progress. Um, this is just the first step in what has been a very uh, systematic process. Um, so that would, you know, change these prices slightly. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and go through those. Um, as you see in alternate one, what we did is we took some of the applications that Eric had just presented and we applied those as we thought 
they might be received. For example, in alternate one, the application at Town Pier would be potentially a granite uh, seawall. At the Town Pier revetment, um, the section between the boat ramp and, um, and the Iron Horse Park, if you will, uh, would, would we assume might be, in this particular alternative, would be an armor stone revetment wall. And then at uh, Barnes Wharf, we applied, again, another granite uh, seawall. And at Veterans slash uh, Mobile Station, another armor stone wall. We then uh, you know, added up those costs, which you see there uh, tallied at the bottom of that column. And to the right of that, uh, uh, those individual costs, we applied a life expectancy of that asset. So we assigned those values, again, working with our consultants, working with some peer review uh, uh, consultants, and, um, and doing a fair amount of research of other, other locations. And we applied a value to each one of those types of or those options, granite seawall, for example, being 85 years, and armor stone wall being approximately 60 years, and, and so on. Um, and uh, those, those ostensibly, again, tell us how long we think that asset's going to last. And a good example, of course, would be the granite, granite seawalls that we have there now that for, for in large part have been there for almost 100 years, I would say. At least. And so applying 85 years at that particular asset is, we don't think is, is a stretch. We think if properly constructed, we might be able to get that life expectancy. Um, so in that row, we tally and we average. Um, so the average of that alternate one comes out to be 72.5 years. Um, we then add uh, some construction administration costs. That's oversight. That's um, um, taking on the project uh, um, as it's happening, all the issues that come up with that uh, quality control. Um, that typically comes in at a little bit less than 5%, but we applied 5% there. And then at this point in, in the project, we assign a contingency value. 15% is not uh, high, although it might seem to be high. At this point, 15% is, is appropriate. And then we tally that row as well. So for uh, alternate one, uh, the total cost at present value doesn't consider any escalation or any future uh, uh, values associated uh, with um, some of these assets becoming due to be reconstructed again. So those are today dollars. If the bid were to go out in 10 years for a project like that, that value would change. Just want to be clear. And um, from that, we understand what the life expectancy is of those assets. We're able to divide that and come up with the total um, uh, life cycle cost analysis. So that value represents what it actually costs us to own that asset. Um, Per year for the for the uh, based on the anticipated life expectancy of that asset, and we continue the same approach at alternate one, except the only distinction here. I'm sorry, alternate two. The distinction there being that instead of a uh, granite seawall, we applied a concrete uh, seawall at uh, both uh, Town Pier and Barnes Wharf. All all the other approaches remain the same. Again, making an assumption that that would be a potential, you know, the most likely approach to those locations. Um, the same tally, uh, re, uh, reassess the life expectancy of those assets. The concrete walls do not provide the same life uh, expectancy that we would get out of a granite sea wall. Um, so we reduce that value to 45 years. Um, and uh, going through the same exercise, we then came up with an average um, uh, life expectancy of those assets with consideration to the total cost, which is lower than alternate one. But as you can see, the life cycle costs associated with that begin to creep up. Um, so uh, we undertook the same exercise in alternate three, except this time we were looking at uh, coated steel sheeting. Uh, and Eric had presented a, uh, a couple of um, examples of that in the prior slides. Um, again, applying the anticipated life cycle or life expectancy of that asset, uh, we can then do the same thing, develop a total uh, average av uh, life cycle of that approach and um, develop a um, total uh, life cycle cost for that um, alternative. Um, so this helps, this helps, I think, uh, the town develop, um, you know, a position in terms of you know where they want and how they want to spend their money 
and how this might impact the decision making process. So with all these alternatives, as with anything else, there are considerations, of course. Uh, um, under alternate one and two for Barnes uh, Wharf and Town Pier, uh, approximately 20% of the total cost is the installation of a temporary coffer dam. And you'll see an example of, of a coffer dam in the next slide. That, that bullet's intended to represent an understanding that when we undertake the work uh, whether it's concrete or it's a, a, a granite wall, there's a certain amount of setup cost, if you will, getting the site ready to actually construct the wall. And 20% is a pretty pretty high uh, portion of that, co that cost, and that cost is applied to a wall, whether it's at 14.2 or 16.2. And so... Um, if there's an incremental cost, and which we, which we expect to be very small, uh, or relatively small, between the 14.2 and the 16.2, and a larger cost associated, or disproportionate cost associated with just setting up the project so you can build a wall, does that mean we need to consider something that's more long-term, uh, higher elevation? And that's something that needs to be considered. Um, the second, the second consideration is that there's, as there is with most projects, there's uh, certainly an economy of scale undertaking work um, uh, with one larger contract at multiple locations. Uh, the sheeting that you see being driven in that uh, photo on the right, down in the bottom right-hand corner uh, can be reused at more than one location. Uh, if you just think about the... Uh, uh, the work itself and the logistics associated with that. If you're a contractor, you can finish one up, pull the sheeting, and just move over to another location. Um, a larger project offers a more appetizing contract uh, for bidding. Um, so there is certainly a, a potential for an economy of scale and taking more, uh, more work, multiple locations, and a larger contract. Difficult to quantify, so we don't assign a value here. We're just, we're just comfortable in saying that. Um, there would be some savings. And then the last bullet uh, that we present here is alternate three uh, uh, with the coded sheeting. Um, it, it does not provide a modular option, meaning that we can work with Beals and Thomas and they can help us design a wall that at, at some point down the road, if 16.2 no longer cuts the mustard and at some at 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the road, we need to add to that wall. In lieu of full reconstruction of the wall, there's an opportunity maybe to add another course of granite or maybe cast another foot uh, two feet on top of a concrete wall. With the sheeting, that's not necessarily the case. The sheeting isn't, um, doesn't provide us that flexibility. So sort of what you, what you install is what you get, and then at some point in the future, and uh, if that needed to change, it would, it would likely require um, an additional uh, approach. So these, these are all considerations, um, things to think about. Um, uh, the cost, I just want to just reiterate that, you know, the cost is still preliminary. Um, they don't include a lot of the ancillary work um, that, um, that would be required with a project like this if it were to include things like landscaping, sidewalks, and parking reconfiguration. But it does help, we hope, give a sense of uh, where the investments um, uh, lie in terms of uh, long term uh, from a life cycle standpoint. So um, I think that's the last slide that I have, Bill. I would ask you to come up and I could turn that over to you. Thank you. Roger. Roger? Can I ask we're going Sure, though, we're going to do all, we're going to do all the questions oh, at, at the end. We're just, we're, this is the last slide and then we'll, we'll open it up. Oh, you want to show? Yeah. So this is this is just a really uh, basic example of what when we say coffer dam or SOE sport of excavation, what it might look like. So this work, um, you can see that the sheeting's been installed just to hold back the water, so the work can take place dry, if you will. And this is a good example of that. Thank you. So this is the culmination of what two and a half years of. Uh, preparing, analyzing, uh, evaluating, coming up with, with concepts and ideas. 
where do we go from here is, is the question. <coughs> well, tonight uh, I expect that our committee has had an opportunity at a prior meeting, our last meeting, to begin to look at the different design alternatives that Eric presented for each wharf. We began to have a sense of what seemed to make sense to the committee, although there, was no, there were no votes taken. It was intended to be an opportunity to begin uh, to have us, us be thinking about the, the, the choices. We didn't have costs then, and there were lots of questions about, <clears throat> well, could we, you know, what, what about a granite wall? What about a steel wall? So the work that's been done in between here, both in terms of uh, evaluating alternatives and then costing them out, and then costing them out on a life cycle basis, all of that has taken place in the last month. I want to thank Roger and Tom and the engineering department for a lot of work here to get us to a point <clears throat> where we have the kind of information that we need to do this balance between aesthetics and safety and cost. Uh, so I, I, I believe that uh, after discussion and, and opportunity for the public that are here to discuss as well, that uh, we will move on to consider for each wharf, uh, each, each of the three locations, what this committee's recommendation might be. Uh, that recommendation will then be shared with both the selectmen and the advisory committee. The advisory committee is going to care deeply about all of this because cost is going to be an issue and they're looking at capital budgets for the town and that's a very important discussion. <coughs> uh, and, and this will be the first alternative we have to really give them a sense of, of cost. Early on, still, uh, a lot of estimating here, but uh, we, we, we have material that we, we just have not had un un until this time. At that point, the selectmen uh, will be in a position to either confirm our recommendation or a, a different recommendation, and then it will be up to Beals and Thomas to proceed to actually develop uh, construction uh, level drawings so that uh, this, this work could actually proceed. And the piece that's not mentioned here, but it would be bulleted right there that would say, figure out how we pay for it. Uh, which is w is the next uh, the next piece in the puzzle? Um, some of my uh, the commentary piece that I included in in the Hingham Journal last week spoke to a couple of different alternatives. Uh, we do expect at this year's town meeting to uh, put forward an article. It's Article 14 uh, that deals with uh, an initial sort of a down payment, if you will, where the town would appropriate up to $200,000 to uh, ma reflect a match if, if the Seaport Bond Council uh, saw fit to keep grant us up to a million dollars, they require a 20% match. We will be making application this summer. By that time, we will have, uh, the permitting process will be further along. That's one possibility. <clears throat> Some uh, may have read uh, the article in the Boston Globe and, and carried uh, on, on uh, social media that uh, the governor in, uh, in, in put into play a capital budget for next year that includes substantial uh, 140 million, 170 million, Roger, I think was the number, something on that order, uh, for uh, municipal uh, risk I issues, including sea level rise. Don't know whether that will be approved by the legislature, but that's another opportunity. Uh, we would obviously be in better shape, perhaps, than some other towns, because I think we are in advance of some other towns of actually having done the work, you know, paid for it out of our own pockets, if you will, uh, whether it's community preservation funds or town funds, uh, and 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 uh, are will be ready fairly soon with quote shovel ready uh, projects. So there's hope for that, uh, but that's. You know, those are the next steps. What I, what I want to do now is open up the conversation first to the committee, and then I'll give the opportunity for anybody in the audience to ask questions as well. Um, we can go back over any of the slide material. You know, we've seen a couple of different things. You know, first was the, the design alternatives that we have looked at at a prior meeting and, and had a sense for, but if we want to revisit those. Secondly, um, the, the treatments, if you will, whether it's uh, armor stone or granite or a, a steel structure or, or even a concrete structure. Uh, 
And then, of course, you know, Roger's prepared to respond to any of the um, dollar issues. So at this juncture, I'm going to go back to my chair and we'll just open this up. Dan, if you'd turn the lights on, unless we need to go back to a slide, in which case we'll, we'll, we may have to darken them again. So to the committee, um, some of this material is familiar, um, but uh, much of it is new. Other members of the committee, questions of me, of Eric or Roger? Sure. Um, uh, please pull the mic close. Uh, the mics are not doing anything in here, but for purposes of the sure. taping. Um, Do I have to push a button? No, it's all, it's all on. It's just okay. a question of getting within about six inches. Uh, with regards to the slide, Roger, on life cycle costs, mm -hmm. um, I had a question. Uh, it's, it's the, it's sort of a, it's, it's a life cycle cost of uh, just the initial capital investment. This doesn't take into account any maintenance that may be required for the various solutions. Correct. And it, are the, do those levels of maintenance vary? I'm guessing yes. I don't really know what's involved um, with maintaining a seawall. Yeah, I, I definitely. I think that any any with any asset, there's usually some amount of maintenance that goes with it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it does not consider maintenance at all. Okay. Yeah. So that could that could change the picture here a little bit. Um, I'm assuming with some of the less durable, less expensive initially solutions, a little bit more expensive over the the term. I think it's also important to note on that slide um, the life cycle cost number is a great back of the envelope um, thing, but it you know uh, you need to look at those in conjunction with the expected life expectancy of each one. Um, so, you know, it's 72 years uh, for alternative one at 126,000 a year, but the other two solutions are only 52 and a half years and 45 years. So I think that's an important thing for people to, to notice. Well, the, the other issue there is is interpreting that number. I mean, what what that says to me, I think, is that on a life cycle basis, Alternative one, which is granite for Town Pier and Barnes Wharf, is actually cheaper on a per year basis, even excluding the potential that some of the other things may require more maintenance than a granite wharf. Our, right. our granite wharves, maybe we should have done more maintenance over the last 100 or 150 years, but they've lasted remarkably well given uh, the, way they were, the way they were constructed and when they were constructed. That I, was really my only question. I, I, I have three questions. Uh, Bruce, again, could you pull your mic a little closer? About six inches is the right distance. So I have three questions. So you mentioned safety and resilience, and, and I'd like to throw in uh, a historic look and feel uh, for the wharfs, uh, especially from the bathing beach when you see Town Pier from the bathing beach. So the concern I have, you know, Eric mentioned that he didn't really know what's under the granite. Uh, on Town Pier when he was doing his, his talk. So, how, Roger, how much does that affect the costs that you put in for the granite rebuild up to another five feet? Well, I'll, I'll let Eric speak to the construction, but, but, it's, uh, but those walls are a full redo anyway. So, if the so it doesn't matter right. if so they're on pilings or not. They're, yeah, they're it's redoing. A, it's, a, it's, a found, it's a concrete footing. Eric, you can jump in, and if it's concrete footing and you're taking off, so it's it's ostensibly, I think a good analogy would be you've got a home that's in complete disrepair, uh, and you're saying, okay, uh, how's the how's the foundation? Like, well, if you're ripping out the foundation and you're starting anew, does it, it shouldn't have too much, too much there. <coughs> Eric, is that a turn at all? No, that's, that's, that's accurate, I was, <clears throat> You know, just trying to provide some context in terms of the, the due diligence that we were doing out here and evaluating different options. Um, you know, with the step back wall option, you know, if we really drill down into, you know, what are the costs um, to do this, what we're, what, we're, what we're faced with is that the, the disrepair of the existing wall, even if you were to have, say, an alternate one, the step back wall the repairs, the extent of the repairs that are needed just to get to, just to get the existing wall back 
um, up to where it needs to be would be so significant that um, you're, you're, it's, we're, we're finding that you may be better off just actually going to the full height out at the face of the wall mm -hmm. um, and just building an appropriate foundation um, during that reconstruction process. Because you've already sunk 20% of your cost doing right. the, the containment wall. Yeah, so exactly. That, that's the conversation that we had a little bit, but without yeah. numbers. Yeah. Uh, when we met a month ago and Roger pointed out you know, given that you, you really have to build the cofferdam, uh, let's get as much height as we can while we can. Uh, and, and, and as he also mentioned, if you use steel, you have no ability to go higher at a later time. You know, we've talked in terms of modular, wanting to try to do what we can for, I'll say, our generation, but also leave the possibility that there could be further uh, um, resiliency height additions at, at a later time and and uh, that alternative would do that if you if you do the step back version I'm not sure you have the same kind of flexibility perhaps you do but then you've got some different aesthetic qualities to deal with so the second question is on the concrete wall numbers that you uh, put up your alternative you so you showed Gloucester Gloucester had a concrete wall with the granite facing do, do these costs have a granite facing or it's just a concrete wall like Marshfield? The cost that we have um, in the cost data, the, the, the concrete seawall option is just for the straight concrete Marshfield, Marshfield okay. option. And on Barnes Wharf, you had uh, two alternatives on the revetment. Uh, and you have one cost here. Uh, is there any alternative uh, for cost savings on a choice of the revetment? Did you say Bruce for Barnes? I, don't I, I'm, I'm think I'm, I'm, I think it was Veterans and, and Mobile. Veterans, veterans and, and Mobile. And, yeah. town, and Town Pier, yes. Uh, was it, can you repeat the question? Yeah, you had two alternatives for a revetment wall. Okay. Yes, one on up to elevation 14 and one right, up to elevation 16, 16 right. too. Uh, but you have no difference in costs here. So does it cost the same whether we go to 14 or 16 or 18? For the revetment wall? For the revetment if wall. You, if we were to increase the revetment wall to 16 versus the 14 option. Correct. No, I, do it, these costs change? Because you only have not, one we cost. At this point, we didn't think it was enough of a change that it warranted a separate, okay. a separate line item. And the difference is? Is so great between revetment in that location versus granite. Gra well, granite or or a uh, a vertical wall, and I'm not sure we even focused at our last meeting when we leaned toward revetment at Eric's point this evening, which I just hadn't been aware of that the possibility of permitting a vertical wall where you don't have one for a substantial portion of that that location uh, is really tough. That I, I I just didn't realize that. Uh, from a, whether it's, it, is that um, Army Corps, Eric, or uh, the DEP? Who, who are the ones who are so uh, wary of vertical walls as a no-no, as a if you will? Well, I think, you know, where you don't have them historically to some extent, um, I think across agencies that's, that's generally the sense currently. Um, you know, there's, there's some General guidance is to definitely not do that, and the um, the time it may it may take. I mean, I'm not we're not saying it's it's impossible. Um, I think you'd have to have a lot of stakeholder meetings, um, and I think that there still would might be, you know, an agency or, or two that in particular just will, will may refu refuse to really kind of buy into the idea of putting a new vertical wall in uh, where there wasn't one historically. Thank you. And final question. Sure, Bruce. So, are we considering a resilience difference between Town Pier and, say, uh, Barnes Wharf? We signed a 30 year uh, agreement with whatever's on Barnes Wharf now. Are we thinking of uh, building something less durable there, knowing it may change 30, 60 years uh, down the line, rather than having a concrete? Uh, historic look and feel like we would have at Town Pier. 
if, if I understand the question, and Roger can chime in here too, I, I think the approach to that's suggested in, in Alternative 1, the, the granite rebuild for both Barnes and for Town Pier are the same. Right. There's, there's no, there's that's what no was deemed, suggested. Yeah, there's deemed to be no, no difference. And the, and the fact that we are obligated under the, under the lease agreement to do that at, at Barnes War, not, we don't, we're not obligated to do that option. For 30 years, we're obligated. Yes. Uh, town Pier, we have no obligation other than to ourselves. That's the town, that's forever. Yes. Both of them forever. Well, but, and, but Barnes Wharf is also forever as well. I mean, I, I think. But in 30 years, it might, we may want to change something. It, it's possible. Uh, I, I participated in a forum last week with uh, Nancy Kerber, Kerber <coughs> uh, current chair of the Board of Trustees of Hingham Maritime. I mean, they're trying to raise three and a half million dollars or so to build a structure that I think they hope will last a lot more than 30, 30 years. So uh, I don't remember whether the lease agreement allows for continuations beyond 30. I mean, I think they hope and expect to be there for as long as we are, the rest of us are a town peer, uh, <coughs> you know, as, as, a, as a public amenity for, bro for rowing and sailing. So we would think of the two as the same as life cycle decision. Yes, very, very similar. I, I don't see a, a difference in my own mind, whether it's, whether it's ours it's because we, we tend to, no, that's, that's not part of the issue. Whether, you know, it's, it's ours after 30 years or whether it continues to be under the direction of Hingham Maritime, I, I think in both we needed to, uh, we need to think in, in, in the same way. I want to mention something that I learned in the interim, by the way, that helped me. We had a, uh, a session with um, Hingham Maritime coming to the town planning department. Uh, the planning group, the conservation commission, the ZBA, the, uh, the planning board, uh, where Hingham Maritime rolled out their f initial plans and designs for their new facility. It's a very um, uh, easy going sharing back and forth uh, so that they could get some sense of how the town might have to deal with their proposal. And what was very interesting to me is that they will have building obligations, construction obligations per, uh, pursuant to the building code that require that they effectively raise that structure three and a half feet above where they are now, mm -hmm. which is, happens to be the same height that uh, the, the proposal that Eric mentioned where we would build the full height at the wall edge and, and bring up the, the pier. So as, as it happens, directionally, we seem to be almost perfectly in sync with what they need to do from a, from a construction perspective. And, and that was something I had not appreciated until we, until we had that meeting. Other questions from the committee first? You know, the uh, cost Pitt? structure, let me have the cost. You don't know. The cost structure seems uh, relatively minor you know, nine million versus seven million over a seventy-year period. So, I would hope that we'd go with the longest-lasting and the most feasible. Because if you're going to spend money, et cetera, might as well spend it for the longer period. Correct? Well, and that that is seen when you go to the uh, the the uh, cost per year. You know, it, it it becomes evident. You're right. right. I mean, it's it's. For, for alternative two, which is concrete, you know, you're talking eight and a half million versus nine, but on a per year basis, you're only gonna get $160,000 worth uh, per year versus because the average life of alternate one or example one is that much longer on a, on a per year basis, that one is, you know, is clearly preferable. Right, plus there's a triple A rated town, I'm sure that they could float a bond or something for the uh, project. Right? That's one of the that's one of the funding alternatives. I just want to I just I support what we've discussed at our meetings before that I think you know these are the two Town Pier and Barnes Wharf are the two most visible wharfs in the harbor. It's you know it's the town's history, Bear Cove. It's where Peter Hobart landed, and I think it's critical that we go with a historic granite that's been there. So I support that alternative. I will also mention that uh, we are in an outreach mode with other committees in town. I met last evening with the Historical Commission. They have jurisdiction over Veterans Park and the mobile station and over Barnes Wharf. 
And Thursday night, uh, Tom Molinari and I will meet with the District Districts Commission. They have jurisdiction over Town Pier because Town Pier is, is within one of the downtown uh, historic districts. It was an interesting meeting with the Historical Commission. We talked for almost an hour. I went through the examples of, of the treatment alternatives uh, as well as the design alternatives. And at the end, um, asked you know, what their views were. I, to me, not a great surprise, given that their, uh, their focus is on the aesthetics. Uh, the unanimous, and they, they did take a motion and, and uh, recorded it, that their unanimous view was granite would be preferable, frankly, for all three, if, if cost and, and permitting were not an issue. Um, revetments, armor stone would be second, and steel, frankly, wasn't even in the equation. <laughs> they, did, they didn't want to consider steel, particularly for Barnes Wharf and for uh, Town Pier. The feeling was uh, Hingham defines itself as a harbor town. Those piers, uh, in their mind, you know, reflect what is the history of the harbor. Uh, and they, they are of a mind that that's, that's what we should be protecting. Whether the Historic Districts Commission, you know, will have the, have the same perspective, I don't know. You know, we are talking about some increases in the height and therefore a slightly smaller <laughs> hill for the iron or bronze horse to rise up upon. But as I uh, look back, I had occasion uh, with the Historic uh, Commission <coughs> Administrator, Andrea Young, to give a talk last week to the Hingham Land Trust annual meeting. And the focus was on the harbor, its history, what we've been doing lately and where we're heading. And when I saw the differences over time since 1635 to 2000, <laughs> and then I compare you know, the relatively modest changes in, in uh, topography that we're proposing for this substantial protection, um, I didn't feel so bad. You know, Town Pier, in several of the photos, had these three enormous coal silos sitting oh. where the Iron Horse is now mm -hmm. uh, when it was Thompson's Coal Wharf. Um, and that's part of Eric's challenge to make sure that there's not coal sludge underneath that, uh, underneath that wharf. But uh, by comparison, we're, we're, we're talking relatively modest changes to the appearance of a harbor that has increasingly gone from industrial to commercial and now principally to recreational use. Eric, please, uh, if pull. you would, just sure. pull closer. You, the mic will only go. <laughs> you just need to pull your chair in a little bit. Uh, we may have discussed this before, and I just forget. Uh, how much of the granite do you think we can reuse? Is it, will it be all of it, or will it depend on what it looks like after we start taking it apart? That actually was a question last night at the Historical Commission, too, Roger. Um, a sense for, to the extent that we need to increase the heights of the wall and therefore need new granite material? Do we have a sense of sourcing and whether we'll be able to mix and match and have it uh, have a similar feel if we go the granite alternative? Uh, you can at uh, this point. Uh, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I don't see any reason why I wouldn't be able to use some of the existing granite. Um, no, I'm talking. He, he's asking the question: We'll be able to re reuse what we have. Yeah, My the secondary question, okay. though, is to the extent that we need more. Do you think we're going to be able to find material that's equivalent? Um, I don't know. So what, what we would do in a case like that is we would begin to, for example, we would call down the Fall River and the contractor. And we, we've done that before f with Old Curb. It's a bit of a, um, um, a hunt, but um, if that didn't work, then uh, we'd, we'd have to seek some other options. But, um, but usually there's, there's a way to find, find it if you look hard enough, yeah. Free benches. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said free benches. Yes. <laughs> for for, uh, for if we'll give up benches in, in exchange for large of, large granite, granite blocks. Block down and we're all okay. Set. And the only other thing was um, the veterans park. You know, even with the 14 or the 16, um, the revetment goes in substantially and takes up land that's currently includes benches and. Um, pathways and I just wanted to make sure that we reach out to the Veterans Council so they're aware of that the layout of that park will change. 
that also was a discussion last night. Uh, it's not principally the Historical Commission's bailiwick, if you will, but they were mindful that um, the revetment eats up parkland, if you will. We're, we're, we're coming further on to the land and reducing the park. I think that's why in our meeting a month ago, we, of, of the three alternatives that we looked at this evening, realizing that the, the stone wall, granite wall, would, was going to be very expensive, the first option, uh, which I think added something like 17 more feet of stonework coming up, um, seemed a little excessive to us, whereas uh, the second option that Eric showed, which was a somewhat lower revetment, allowing the land uh, and, the in and the increased slope of the land as you get to 3A to act as par part of a barrier as necessary, uh, would, would eat up less of the parkland, but would still provide protection under, under most scenarios. And in terms of the veterans, uh, I did reach out to Keith German, our veterans agent, and I told him, Keith, A, I want to get together with you because if any of you have walked down there, literally the, the Vietnam Vet Memorial is, this, this, it's been gouged Probably. out yeah. right, right behind the memorial itself mm -hmm. because of these, these recent storms they were hitting, hitting directly. So he, they're aware. I, I picture, frankly, that uh, that memorial will need to be re rethought once we uh, move in a direction on the on the the wall treatment itself, and and think about that in connection with our park, uh, our uh, harbor walk extension. You know, how do we use that land? How do we tie it into the mobile station? So I, I absolutely agree. We have two members of the public with us, uh, Mr. Wedig, or do you have questions? And if you do, please uh, come to the mic and just uh, ask a, of anybody here. That's this is a public meeting, and we welcome them. Yes, please. Okay, I'm Rosalind Conroy from the Maritime Center. So I think my question is for the design team. Um, first off, thank you for the life cycle cost analysis. I know I've been talking about that a lot with the different treatments, but I think it's an important part of selling the project to the public, especially with it feeds into the initial ROI that first sparked why protecting the investments was important. Um, so great, and I think the granite approach, especially seeing the durability over time, is 100% the right choice for the wharfs you've identified. Secondly, on Barnes Wharf, from a programmatic point of view and actually running that facility, I know I mentioned that before in the last meeting, but the wall you have there that comes onto the actual wharf proper, um, especially as a new building comes in and the program function changes, it just creates a lot of difficulty essentially for the parking. And I understand the issue being that the state seawall is lower um, so we've been proactively discussing this with other people in the community for suggestions. And one important suggestion that came out was perhaps the town could seek an easement from the state to actually come up closer and improve the state's seawall in order to not um, be on barns as much. So I wanted to just put that out there. I didn't know how fixed that design was or as the design it goes into the advanced stages, whether if an easement becomes popular, I'm just really kind of trying to, parking's at such a premium and with the Summer Street Corridor still being really um, undecided that maybe that was something, is that the only design? Is the town open to maybe partnering with the state to bring that protective barrier much closer to the state's, what that would do for the cost of barns to bump that out and around, you know, that way rather than going into the land? So one of the one of the challenges with moving the the um, the secondary wall closer to the existing um, state sea wall is is has to do with um, the structural integrity of that. So so that wall, even though um, you know it was it was something that we had we had evaluated, and it's <clears throat> you have to be cognizant of the additional loading that you're putting on. Yeah, and how close you can really get to that existing wall without um, basically 
uh, risking this, the, the, the integrity of the whole thing, right? So you could, you could try to get it closer, um, and there, there probably is some, some work that we could, uh, to some extent, do to try to evaluate um, you know, how close we could get. Um, however, if you get too close, putting that additional the new wall um, too close could cause the whole thing to basically collapse at some point. So, so I that's one of the I challenges. Guess part of perhaps the question is if the equipment's already mobilized and the machinery and everything's already in there, is there a prospect of improving the wall structurally? Because that is an identified vulnerable point. So not building on top of a failing wall, restoring a failing wall to resiliency height to the point where you get around that corner and reduce that vulnerability. Do you have a, do you have a donor in mind who is uh, prepared <laughs> to uh, come up with the incremental funding for, <laughs> for it's this? An it's an idea. I mean, it's going to have to happen someday, right? The walls, it's all, it's, you know, so Robin Paul to pay Peter. But give, uh, I'd like to work with the consulting team and give, yeah, we'll take that. Why don't we take that back and see if there's another way to skin that. Uh, yeah. I know, that's, <coughs> as you might imagine, sitting here and saying, here, is the solution is is not no. Good. I'm not yeah. asking you guys. No, to I know. I just well for those who might be watching at home, say okay, what okay. can you do? Uh, so we, what, we, what we'd like to be able to do is because um, uh, we because uh, we are sensitive to what you're saying, Roseman. So why don't we give us the opportunity to take this back? Because right today, I don't know that we're finalizing that necessarily, and we'll see if there's a different a different approach. That could so be just to consider. remind those at home, Roseman, thank you for the question. It's a good sure. question. I'm going to sit down. Um, the other uh, point to be made, the slide, who's got this, the clicker at this point? You do. Isn't it there? Uh, you might have to tap the TV. I think the computer. Okay. I, I can just remind people. The, the, the uh, chart that showed the heights of various structures around the harbor, the rotary is at 9.3 feet. So it's lower. We did not prioritize that as a... a it is a town-owned wharf, mm -hmm. technically. The, the fact that Route 3A is on it perhaps give us, gives us some say with the state as Route 3A is redesigned, but we've been asked not to think that we're going to get much help from the state. So at some point, to your, to your point, we may have to address this. It is lower than what we are projecting to do with the town-owned wharves. So, you know, there's, there's some validity to the question, but unfortunately it's, it's probably true for the entire length of the rotary wall, which at this juncture we have not prioritized. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, because we know until we've, we have a sense of where we're going with the state and the highway, I don't think it, it makes sense to try to second guess that and plan, f plan for that now. While we're on, oh sorry. Sure. No. While we're on Barnes Wharf, can we talk about the real, you know, how realistic it is with the Hingham Maritime uh, development plans to, in all of the images, this pathway along the perimeter of Barnes Wharf keeps showing up. And, you know, now shells and boats, you know, are stored and right over the lip of the wharf. So I just don't know how realistic, you know, the town, you know, citizens have said they would love a contiguous walking path all along the harbor, but I just want to know how realistic that is without you know impeding the maritime center's logical storage abilities and development plans i'm going to frame that question a little bit because it is it's an important one uh, i think there's some chapter 91 implications here which uh Hingham maritime is aware of um that's why i think there is uh, a sign that says this is a this is a public dock because it, it is. I, I don't know the answer in terms of um, the contemplated walkway or a continuation of the walkway. Part of the I, I think part of the issue that Nancy Kerber would say to us is w once we have our shell storage facility, which is t totally different in terms of the way the the wa the uh, property is used. Uh, they're no longer storing shells, you know, at, at right angles to the length of the wharf, but rather inside a structure and up on. So, Nancy, I, Rosamond, you may be able to answer that too. But um, so I, I see Chapter 91 implications, and I see uh, Hingham Maritime 
thinking that they're going to try to re reuse that space much more efficiently. Rosamond, do you want to add anything? And if you do, please come up to the mic. Maybe just stay in the front row. <laughs> it's easier. Okay. Um, yeah, we are obviously in, in proceeding beyond the concept stage, but the major the fleet, the whole idea behind building the building is to store the fleet inside. And we are aware of the Chapter 91 requirement that there be public access to perimeter wharves. The docks are not public, but we treat them um, generally that way. Um, but the uh, the issue is obviously something that, you know, you get your civil engineering team to address and you meet the state requirements. And, um, you know, if it turns out that we need to have a designated pathway around the perimeter of the wharf, that's what the regulation says, then um, that's what it is. But that's obviously something that our, you know, design team and building committee and attorneys work out and we meet the same kind of requirements as anybody else who built on the waterfront. Eric or Roger, do you, anything you want to add or feel is necessary to add to? No, I'll just add that, you know, uh, our designs as, as well as, um, as Hingham Maritime's own um, is, is conceptual at this point. You know, we're trying to, sh to provide um, uh, some, on a relative basis, some of the options we've, we've been considering so that we can try to work towards um, a, a preferred alternative. Um, you know, I, al I alluded to the fact that, um, you know, the pathways, the parking, the, um, the, the, the landscaping uh, and other amenities, you know, is, is not really kind of the focus of tonight's presentation in that while we may have, you know, shown um, a pathway there at a, at a conceptual level, uh, there's nothing at this point that's that's set in stone by any means, and and we would certainly try to make it as to be as as compatible, um, um, as as the building uh, with the building program that's proposed there as as possible, and that it'll it'll ultimately really be, I think, at Barnes Wharf, um, um, just meeting what the state requirements will be. Well, so I just want to just echo what <laughs> Eric was saying is. So the hope was that the goal, and I think you've, the chair has already framed this, but for, for the sake of restating it, the goal was to say, yeah, well, we'd like to see this a granite wall at this location, an armor stone wall at this location. We'd like to see maybe a target bronze wharf at 16.2, and then a lot of the other stuff that needs to be, and it's, and it's common in these meetings, we begin to delve into some of the other issues that need to be addressed. But walking away with that information will help inform the next process, which will begin to talk about some of the things that Rosemans brought up and some of the other committees have brought up, that members have brought up. Thanks. You're welcome. Other yeah. observations, questions? Yes, Ed. <coughs> Just sort of two things to add, and this could be a suggestion. If we don't have enough granite to bring everything up to the elevation that we want, are we allowed to build up the concrete foundation higher? Because I don't really think, once you've got all the sea growth and everything, you're not really looking at you know, much down there at the low tide level. So adding concrete to bring what granite we have up, you know, may, may work. But uh, I, I want to keep in mind the idea of, and this could be a long shot, but the possibility that if we can steal some of the footprint of Whitney Wharf as, as it, we give it back to the ocean and, you know, create a new steamboat. seabed. You mean steamboat or Whitney? Steamboat, yeah, ste steamboat wharf, I'm sorry, and in order to add to the footprint of Barnes Wharf. You use that granite like in a sacrificial basis, to the right? East. Well, well, as Alan mentioned in the last meeting, you know, a project in Boston where they were able to increase the footprint of a seawall uh, in one part of Boston Harbor, and, the, and the, there was a swap where they actually gave them some wetlands back somewhere else in East Boston. And Barnes Wharf needs every inch that we can add on to it, and I would. I mean, I think if you took this line and drew it straight in into the uh, the state wall, you're you know it's it's only a couple of feet more maybe of sheet pile, a lot more fill, maybe a few more granite blocks. But I don't think it would it would just I think it would only add the cost of the fill to that you know to increase that footprint, and that would take away this whole you know parking and this 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 low state wall issue all in one. So. I don't know if it, it could be a long shot, but I want to, I'd like to keep that in mind moving forward if we can, you know, because Barnsworth could use every, every inch we can add to it. The only 
thing I, I will just react for the public is that we have not prioritized Steamboat Wharf. Uh, there may be others in town for whom Steamboat Wharf represents, you know, an enormous opportunity. I remember bringing our uh, landscape architect from Presley Associates out onto that wharf, and he got out to the end and he said, wow, you know, and he hadn't said that on any of the other wharves. It, it's so much more proximate to World's End uh, yes, it's in the poorest condition of any of the wharves. Uh, one could argue, well, take, we'll take any used granite off of that. But for another generation or some uh, fairy godparent who might come along and, and say, look, I really want to fix that wharf and I have a, a, a vision. Uh, I, I, I would be reluctant to do anything uh, excessively damaging. I, I, I think there may be other alternatives. We, we saw a slide last week in that uh, historic presentation of the town <coughs> saying that the granite blocks that were used to originally build Whitney Wharf came from the Hingham Quarry behind the courthouse on Washington Boulevard and from the Quincy Quarries. Uh, we have another story in town where when the stairway to the Heritage Museum was redone, we needed to match the granite there, and, and then selectman and, and contractor John Riley managed to find granite that matched. So as you look at the front of the Heritage Museum, even though there is new granite worked into that wall, you, you wouldn't know the difference. I think the expectation and hope would be that we can find sufficient additional material. Uh, I hear you in terms of, you know, the Barnes Wharf needs, but I um, want to be mindful of other generations too. Uh, it, it is for the other next generations. <laughs> so other commentary, questions uh, from the public? If not, I think we need to proceed to act on this. Um, I'm going to suggest that we need to do this, Roger, wharf by wharf. Yes. I, I don't think it's um, – can you get that back on, Deirdre? I'd just like to put this um, – have the clicker? I have the clicker. But the clicker for That's the tower. So I just want to try to bring back up that cost slide. Here we go. Thanks. Uh, hang on a second. First, I got to get it to react. doesn't seem to want to go backwards. So let me just just refer to it. Um, and Rosamond, I think we can we can have the um, the lights back up. <clears throat> so if we if we deal with this as as three <coughs> three votes of our committee, um, three recommendations. I think we're, we're, we're picking up on, on two aspects. One, the alternatives that Eric walked us through, and second, the treatment you know, alternatives in terms of granite versus stone versus uh, steel. So at our, at our last meeting, we seem to be coming, thank you, Roger, to a conclusion that of the pages that you have uh, from the presentation tonight, we were leaning toward alternative two, Alternative two at town. I'm, I'm, let's we'll deal deal with town pier first, uh, which we always did prioritize. That um, alternative two would have a revetment in that sandy beach area, um, and would have a face of the wall height of 16.2, no secondary wall. Um, there are some various parking alternatives, Brian. Some of those done in response to your question about could the parking be flipped. I think we'll deal with that as a secondary issue because I know Historic Districts, for example, is going to have some questions about that. Great. And I'll deal with that on Thursday and then we'll have more information. But we don't, the point is for guidance to our uh, marine consultant engineers, they, that's, that's a land problem and we'll, we'll deal with that in the future. So we, we were leaning toward alternative two, which as I said is 16 feet, two inches um, at the wall face. Yes, Brian? So the slide on the screen is the life cycle cost. Okay. And I believe that you're referring to alternative two on the drawing. No, I am. Okay. Yeah. So I, just to yep. eliminate confusion. That's not so back. one more. 
it's that it's this one here was the alternative that we were contemplating seemed to be headed in that direction at our last meeting i don't think i think we've only had you know more information this evening that helps us um particularly being aware of the cost of a coffer dam that if you have the opportunity to to add height to the face of the wall and add resiliency and what's the word our mod our modular concept if you if you design this so that it can carry more uh this this one seems to make the most sense and then i think universally tonight granite granite for town pier in part because it does stick out into the harbor you see it from from multiple sides it's it's the most uh iconic maybe it's a, a, a toss up between barnes and 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 this wharf so I, I think that's our direction, but I, I would ask uh, if someone would want to move that that be our recommendation. I would move for Town Pier drawing alternate two to be our recommended solution. And in granite, not in, in granite. Sorry. Yes. Okay. At with with the revetment portion uh, relating to that sand beach area for the reasons that that Eric has described. Is that included, Brian? Yeah, so I would move that we go with Town Pier concept alternate two uh, with granite block and the revetment structure um, for the 16.2 height. Thank you. Is there- I would second it. Is there a second? I second it. Is there further discussion of that treatment and, and alternative for Barnes Wharf? I'm sorry, sorry, for Town Pier? No. If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 So that's a unanimous vote. Let's move on to uh, Barnes. Here again, <clears throat> we really looked at two alternatives. One was the step back wall on a portion of the of the property, as opposed to once again the entire uh, face of the wall being. And I'm going to go ahead to this slide. I hope uh, here is here is alternative two. Um, Rosamond has raised the question about whether something can be done here for future consideration and but but basically the notion that again the height the entire 162 is at the face of the wall we're aware of the need for a coffer dam again that that argues for for doing it this way <clears throat> could I if, if that is still the sense of the meeting could I have a motion um, comparable motion in terms of the alternative and the material Someone else be willing to make that so Brian doesn't have to make them all? I motion that we uh, go with the alternate two for Barnes Wharf. In, in granite? In granite. <coughs> Is there a second? I second it. Uh, further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Again, a unanimous decision. Um, and finally, moving back, I think. Yes. Um, here we looked at three alternatives. So Bill, quick question. These are not labeled anywhere with page numbers or anything? Page uh, they are they are in Just, order in your okay. um, materials in oh, about no the middle of the, numbers. there aren't page numbers, but down here, Tom, is where the alternative is on the lower right, Veterans Park. So Veterans Park, we looked at, at three alternatives. This was the most invasive, if you will, on the park, which would raise the revetment to 16 feet two. The other alternative that we looked at was a somewhat lower revetment, not eating up as much of the park space. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, that would bring us at the edge to 14 feet two, but it saves about six or eight feet by my calculations of parkland <coughs> and, and or walkway. Um, and we did look and, and at least consider tonight uh, the question of a wall, um, but there are cost implications to that, and there are some permitting application implications to that as well. So that I think, uh, again, consensus at our last meeting seemed to be alternative two, uh, but again, um, I'd entertain a motion on, on alternative and uh, materials. I'd make a motion to approve alternate to design drawing alternate two for veterans park 
uh, where we would do the stone revetment to elevation 14, uh, regrade a portion of the terrain within the park to get to elevation 16.2. Um, I, I think, think I think it. that's sufficient, Brian. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? No. More more to come on this one, I think, because of the veterans. But I'll I'll reach out to them. All in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 So again, we seem to have um, unanimous agreement. The end of a long process. Um, the start of a longer one. Probably, but um, I want to thank uh, the Bills and Thomas team and, and the Hingham engineering team who are dealing with two major topics this week. They also have presentations tomorrow night and the following night uh, regarding the 3A task force. Roger gets a three night in a row uh, try here. <coughs> so um, to pull this material together for us so that we really had some basis for decision is, is uh, very useful and valuable. So I want to thank you all. I think we can go on to the rest of our meeting, which will be relatively brief in comparison to this topic, but don't need to hold uh, the engineering teams with appreciation. Thank you. Have a good night. Tom, um, I'm going to keep those boards until Thursday, and I'll just bring them with us to our meeting with historic districts. Perfect. Eric and Dan, thank you very much. Thank you. So, looking See back tomorrow. to the rest, <laughs> looking back to the rest of our agenda, um, a couple of people couldn't be here tonight. I had expected Alan, but I think I can cover for him. Uh, I knew that Ken Ken had a had a uh, Ken Corson, our harbor master, had a conflict, so I don't have as much to fill in on on his front. On the bathing beach, um, what I can share with you is that. Uh, Alan Peralt and uh, Roger Fernandez have been working very hard on this modular approach to the snack shack. Um, they've been talking with uh, several contractors and there seems to be an appetite uh, for putting in a bid uh, at a cost that works within the, um, the, the dollars that are available to us. There's nothing guaranteed until you have a, a bid in hand uh, they expect to put the bidding papers out uh, this week. These final conversations were literally over last week, beginning of this week. So I, I think the, uh, the direction is good. We all, we all know we, the, the original bids just came in too high and, and could not be uh, addressed. But with this uh, modular approach, I think, I think there's a good shot at it. Uh, the Grove uh, Harbor Walk, I don't know if anyone's been down. As of yesterday, they had about 20 feet left. It's, um, it's r remarkable. I think it looks terrific. What I didn't understand, if any of you have been down there, as, as you face out to the harbor, on the end of the current harbor walkway to the left-hand side, closest to the bathhouse, they um, put in a concrete supporting structure to allow trucks and front-end loaders to come and put sand directly onto that far end of the beach that gets scoured the most. I asked Tom, well, it didn't, the, that the uh, brick walkway is going to get depressed as you drive trucks over. He said, we, know, we knew that. <laughs> we put concrete and steel rebar underneath the brick. Hmm. So uh, even though the first pass as they drove their trucks to put new stonework in, um, did do a job on the brickwork. It's been redone and it's now over uh, steel reinforced concrete. So I think we're, we're in good shape. Happy to also report that the contractor has agreed, if you looked at the very far end, at the other end <coughs> of the e existing harbor walk, uh, we lost some of the brickwork that was beginning to break up because of the storm on uh, March 3rd. Uh, contractor is going to repair that as as we speak so uh, that will be done as well all before town meeting so i think in terms of um, looking ahead to the next portion of the harbor walk that will be a part of town meeting will will be we will have fulfilled our commitment to do the first two pieces so that was basically alan's report deirdre um maybe you want to give a sense of what's happening with the pilot and your meetings tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, yep. Tomorrow and, yes, Thursday. Tomorrow and Thursday, yep. Uh, tomorrow night and 
Thursday night, tomorrow night here at back at Town Hall, and Thursday night at Hull High School in Hull out on Pemberton, or out on uh, Hull Gut. We will have two public information meetings overviewing the Summer and Rockland Street Road Diet Pilot. So again, that is um, this summer, beginning May 24th and continuing through July 30th, uh, Summer Street from east of the Rotary uh, will drop from four lanes to two, meaning one travel lane in each direction. Uh, we'll open back up to four lanes and a turning lane at the Martins Lane traffic light. As you crest over the hill onto Rockland Street, it'll drop down to two lanes again um, and then open up to four again at the intersection of Rockland Street and George Washington Boulevard. This, um, so tomorrow night, the engineers will go over the plan for that. We will um, discuss the work that Safety Services has done between the towns of Hingham, Cohasset, and Hull to ensure that um, safety service vehicles can get through and that the purpose of the pilot is to test in real time what multiple traffic engineering studies have told us um, will work, which is a reduction of speed and thereby, thereby a reduction in high injury accidents along this corridor to make Summer Street and Rockland Street safer as part of one leg of the overall 3A safety improvement project, which of course will then continue in future years to the rotary, not the pi road diet, but imp safety improvements on the rotary and 3A from the rotary to the bathing beach. So I would love people to come out um, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock or Thursday night at Hull High at 7 o'clock. Um, well, the town manager of Hull has been very cooperative with us. A lot of the public uh, feedback from Hull, as you can imagine, and as was the case last year, has been very negative. Um, you know, we hope with greater understanding people understand, you know, what this is generating from. But, you know, we could use as much support as possible um, because this will, this is really, the success of this is important for the overall success of the 3A project, which impacts all of our harbor work. So, appreciate if you can come out. I'll remind us that until nine months ago, this was our, ba our bailiwick, yeah. if you will. Uh, I, I think the, the, the newly constituted task force, which the selectmen put in place last spring, uh, was a little slow getting started, but um, has been energetic recently. And as it, uh, it, Judy Sneath is the chair, a former uh, planning board chair. Alan Peralt is on it, Deirdre is on it. Remind me of the other members. Bryce Blair. Right. Selectman and, Healy. And, and Paul Healy, mm -hmm. our selectman. So yeah. it's an important meeting. I, I plan to be, I can make the Wednesday meeting, but not the whole meeting because I'm in front of historic districts that night. Any questions? Anything you want to ask me about? When did, when did you say the road diet starts again? May 24th. May 24th. Okay. Thank you. Two months. So it's longer than contemplated for last summer. It's actually a better it's a better pilot because it's it's really in prime time, and we'll f we'll find out. You know, does it, you know can it can it can the can the road handle the traffic using using two lanes? So. And I think that you know the comp the what we over and over you know beating it, you know, really repeating it can't repeat it enough is this happens every day with more volume every day than Summer Street sees at its peak on a hot summer day at the Lobster Pound on 3A. Every single day this happens. So it's, the blowback is, again, seems questionable because we already see this happening every day without massive backups and standstills. And actually, at that location, that's picked up the traffic coming oh, up. Just as Cushing volume, Highway, right. there's more so volume at the Lobster right. Pound than there is. If it's not is. a summer Saturday, it's, it's right. you know, so it's, um, Thank you, Deuter. Um, as I mentioned, Ken Corson could not be here. I, the two things I'm aware of, he's uh, completed his um, uh, filming capability around the harbor. It all feeds into his new location. But to my knowledge, I don't think he's full time yet in his new location in the transportation building at the uh, uh, shipyard. And I think that has to do with a continuing discussion, negotiation between the MBTA um, and Mass Department of Transportation in the town about what our appropriate cost 
coverage for the small space that he has. It's a question of how much common space the town should pay, given that most of the common space is for ferry, uh, ferry personnel. But uh, is that and, a renegotiation? Yes, it is. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's been uh, been ongoing. MBTA. But I think I think you'll find that Ken's office is still on the third floor of Town Hall at the, at this point. So, uh, new business, uh, I'll just mention um, the warrant is out, I don't know, the nice bright yellow color. Two articles that relate to uh, our matters, actually three, if you consider that there's a sewer article that relates to providing sewerage onto Barnes Wharf, Ed, for the um, Hingham Maritime, that's an important article too. Um, but the other two, Article 14 is the one that I mentioned about the wharves and, and making a, a bit of a down payment and appropriation to hopefully be matched by the state. Um, and then as part of Article 17, Article 17 is the Community Preservation Act and the recommendations from CPC that include a harbor walk extension continuing from the parking lot at the bathing beach across in front of the um, uh, bandstand and, and over to the parking lot for the um, lo uh, boat launching ramp. So those are the ones that matter to us. Uh, Alan Peralta and I are talking about who will represent our committees uh, for, for both of those projects. I obviously will for the Harbor Wars. Um, the work day is planned for this Friday. Uh, yep. Principally going to be Baby Beach trustees, yeah, right? Yeah, we didn't really get assigned anybody, which is. But I, I don't. I was just trying, looking over this list here. Do you know what Alan? Three to eight students to research old photos of Hingham Harbor. There's been some discussion about that. I, I heard from I think it was Chris Daly, that um, you know in, in some respects what what has been put together by yes. Eileen. Uh, what it what it may. Oh, this is Eileen. Um, McIntyre for the Land Conservation Trust meeting. She gathered a, just a remarkable set of photographs. But uh, it it's just wets, wets the chops a little bit in terms of, well, what else is out there with, with further research? So I think that, that that's part of a continuing conversation, that, but that's all I've heard. I don't know more than that. Okay, so it's Ed, who's, ma Chris isn't here, so is it Ed and uh, and Alan, or because Alan has a lot of kids, he's got 18 kids for beach cleanup, which I also am curious about. I wish Roger, um, well, no, Roger doesn't have, it. but DPW was down there all day today, um, and like last year, it there's it was pretty clean. So that's not our, it's not our. I'm just wondering if Alan's tracking on that because those kids have to be kept busy from 9:30 to 1:30. Ed and Alan have that one. I, Brian, right, I hang a marathon. Yeah, they got the Hingham Maritime has a lot of kids too. So I'm just curious because then you, you, you have your own group. Yeah, they've got their own group. How many? Do you a know? A lot. Oh, so I have it right here. Last year, they came up the harbor and reached us and got put to work until the bitter end. A few of them clearly regretted. <laughs> <laughs> Hingham Maritime has two, four, six, eight, ten. They have ten. Well, I I, I certainly hope the the portion of the waterfront between Barnes Wharf. And Steamboat Wharf would be addressed because you look at that, and that's yeah, and that's. that's so we have giant floats that have, I don't know. All right, I'll tell Alan to. Um, they're, not a, they're not our equipment. Well, and, and and then the question becomes: Look, can we can we team up with DPW to say, yeah. look, we'll get we'll get the kids to heft it up onto the wharf if you'll come and and take it away, you know, with with Hingham DPW trucks and that kind of stuff. And I mean, that's how it worked last year. <coughs> but but it, last year it was just trash. This this year it's 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 big stuff that's come ashore in this in this storm. Yeah, and I just don't know like are those 10 kids researching or eight kids with Alan researching old photos are they going to show up at Hingham Historical? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um I I think you probably should reach out to Alan. I I had thought he was as I said I had hoped he would be here tonight. Yeah. But so I, I think you're off the hook. To, I don't think we don't have anybody reporting to duty directly. for HDC, which is good. Tom, that, uh, volunteered. Ducks and bullets. <laughs> Somebody said they'd send me the contact, and I went over the high school two days, but both times they had snowstorms. So yeah. I was uh, off the hook. Okay. <coughs> I'd be happy to, uh, I'll call Alan. You want me to call Alan? I'll call Alan. Um, yeah, I'm just curious that <coughs> if, if getting closure on I those. I thought Chris was going to do it, but I'll. Uh, he's out of town. I thought he was too. Chris he will be away. I mean, I, I know he came through late saying, hey, he, he was going to be 
physically away, so was not able to help out. Check with Alan. Yeah. Similarly, our other uh, event coming up oh, is yeah. is Grape, uh, the Battle of Grape Island Day, yes. uh, where I guess the ceremony will be a little different than last year, its first year. Yes. Mm -hmm. So working in tandem with the town's historical commission, the veteran services, um, our alumni, Paula Sordo, um, that it's Sunday the 20th from 1 to 3 at Hingham Harbor, and it's the Hingham Militia, and by formal invitation, the first, I'm going to get it wrong again, basically British Redcoats. Awesome. So there will be a legitimate battle. Something of foot, right? Yeah, the first the regiment of foot, A-F-O-O-T. So there will be a legitimate battle um, yes. representing the start of the Provisions War, which was the Battle of Grape Island, and when the British soldiers tried to take the hay, you know, off of Grape Island that was owned by the Thaxters in downtown Hingham, uh, the c colonial militia drove them off. And that was the beginning of the Provisions War. So um, there will be cake and refreshments and remarks and a battle. Will they, one, will they fight all. over? One to three on May 20th, Sunday, May 20th, which is the day after Taste of Hingham. It's going to be great. Will they fight over who gets to keep the bandstand? No, they will <laughs> not fight over that. Okay. But the, on May 19th, Taste of Hingham, do we want to do another table? <laughs> Well, actually, la last as year the we did three A task force we, actually, we but did, I don't know if one. We did two tables last oh, year. Right. One, we one did. we did for the Taste of Hingham, and the, the other we did, did for Touchaboat, touch which is later. Mm -hmm. I don't know the date of Touchaboat this year. Yeah. I think it's June or Rosamond. Would you know by chance? Touchaboat. Like um, so it's uh, we can address that at our at our next meeting okay. probably. Okay. I could find out, but I know that um, Amy's not running it. It's going to be Ken. Or touch about. Yep. Ken okay. Corson's running it? Yep. Wow. But as far as um, Taste of Hingham, did we do did we do it last year? We did something. Yes, we did. Brian and I did mainly answered questions. We had the whole um, the whiteboard. We had the plans. We had the three A plans. Mm -hmm. And we had yeah, we had the three A plans, the bathing beach, bathhouse, renderings. We got, we so got some traffic. Did just sit in the chair and talk to your mom most of the time? <laughs> <laughs> no, is, is then you talk to somebody <laughs> at length from the, the Capital Outlay board? Committee. Oh, was great. There was tons Shout of food. Go. I'm not sure it's necessary. It was is this in part just sort of keeping, keeping us outreach. more visible yes. in front of the public? Yep. Um, yep. Sense of the meeting? or I mean, if we're going to say we'll do it, we have to man it. Um, $100. That I think we can manage. Um, yeah. It's more, it's more, you know, we'll no, no, people. What do you think, Brian? Do you know? Um, yeah, what I did, think it was valuable. I mean, what did we have for a favor? Point. Did we give it, did give anything yes, away? Yes, we did. We had little toys. A little, yeah, there Rocks was, you had the, the uh, thing that people could sign. Which, Rocks, which you had to right police the whole ideas, time because yeah. the kids were all writing. Inappropriate things. things. Oh, yeah. what are you most like to do at the harbor? <laughs> and a lot of it involved. Not substances. illicit activities. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. It was good, though. Yeah, it was I good. Know. I'm not interested in. Well, now they can comment because you know the other topic, major topic for town meeting is is uh, marijuana. Yeah. So well, the <laughs> their comments might be more appropriate. All right. But we, so but this actually, this we should get Paula Sordo down there because Saturday's, the value of a table on Saturday is to promote the battle, celebration on Sunday. And that so that's uh, May yeah. 19th. Yeah, that would be fun. So yeah. That's a good hook for him. All with a musket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he might be very. Brian, would you be willing with I mean, others? Yeah, that baby. The 19th. Bruce, could you, could you I join? I, I'll I'm help out. I don't know if I'll I'm here on the too. 20th. I'd have to How check. about the 19th? 19th. We, was, we, we, we check. want you for the 19th, Bruce. Uh -oh. It's fun. You get to you meet a lot of people and you hear yeah. public yeah. feedback. I'll, I'll I've missed it for the past three years. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so we have. Come in for at least a We have Eric. I'll baseball game, but I'll get there somehow. Yeah, I'll do it too. And maybe Bruce. Yes. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Maybe at the last minute, maybe I can make it. I have a sunfish we could give away. That would be <laughs> great. I was thinking that. Here you go. Yeah. Second prize is two. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was Paul Lasorio. Oh, yeah. All right. Really Final good. topic. Uh, I just wanted to. I, I'm aware that the DPW and the Conservation Commission did team up yeah. to uh, 
think about the damage to the harbor uh, on a lot of fronts. Uh, I think I think this impacted uh, <clears throat> the sacrificial dune to the extent that that needed to be replaced. Also, the degree to which sand carried down onto um, the 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 boat ramp for one. But um, interestingly enough, I, I thought that the sand um, the dune grass in front of the boat. parcel for parking, you know, parking for the boat ramp, did its job. I mean, it, it held. You began to see some erosion along the front of the, the arc of the beach in front of the um, bandstand. Not, not excessive because it, it's, it's past, it's around the corner. The, the, the hardest hit was the bathing beach wall itself, right at the end of the wall. But um, I know that they were working together. That's why Surprisingly, I mean, given how, how terrible things looked, it, it's really not too bad no. down there. And they cleaned up um, Iron Horse Park, so all the seaweed and everything. Looks really good. It's all good. That's, I felt I was like, okay. oh, they're going to be keeping trying to keep busy with those kids on Friday. Well, we Students. hope for no more. Uh, what was the name of that storm? Riley. Riley. I didn't know Riley had its name, but uh, public. Any other questions from you as we wrap up our session here? Thank you for coming, both of you. And, and I'll say this as well to my neighbor, Jay Devon. Uh, finally, a next meeting. Uh, I'm looking at May. Um, the dates that seem to make sense from where we are now would be something like Tuesday the 15th or the 16th Wednesday or the 17th on a Thursday. Tuesday the 15th works best for me. Me too. Yeah, Wednesdays are no good for the rest of the summer for Eric and I. Yeah. Because you're sailing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, right. Investigating the harbor. From Cl the up water. close yeah. and personal. <laughs> uh, Brian and Tom, a sense, does the... The 15th is good for me. I'm um, supposed to be on travel for work for the rest of the week. Okay. So let, is good. Let's, uh, let's go with Tuesday the 15th. Um, does anyone have anything else to bring up that I didn't know about? Brian, thank you for the minutes so so quickly last time. These yeah. minutes, I think, will be important. Um, we won't be able to approve them till our next meeting, but I know we'll need to reference them in conversations with the selectmen and with the advisory committee. I'm not going to try to do those sessions before town meeting because I think there's too much else on both of their plates um, at, at this at this juncture, but. The next step will be to get in front of those two committees again and say, "We're there. We've got a recommendation. Uh, let's let's go on to uh, give give Eric the, the go ahead to actually put plans and begin permit work." If nothing else, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. My deal with. Uh, television folk is when I pound the gavel it's a gavel to gavel deal and they'll turn the thing off so 